what kind of tactical ideas are interesting and basic to understand that once you understand, you uh, you take early leaps in improvement? Yeah, so it's things like forks, for example, where you attack two pieces at the same time, discovered attacks like checkmates, and again, winning like a queen or, or other material. Those are probably two most important ones, um, batteries uh, or batteries and pins, things of that, things of that nature. How many, also how rich important. is the world of, and by the way, discovered attacks are when you move a piece. Mm -hmm. And you, you put a king in check to win like a rook for example, or, or other material. And forking pieces is when you're attacking two pieces, so obviously the other person can't move two pieces at a time, and they're gonna have to lose one of them. Okay, so how big is the world, the universe of forks and discovered attacks? Like, um, you, you know, I I, I I, myself know, so there's like knights mm -hmm. attacking like a, what is, what is there, it? There are like, forks knight attacking like a queen and a rook, for example, queen or like a rook. pawn attacking a queen and a rook, um, or like a rook and a bishop. Um, it's innumerable. There, I mean, but I will say that I think that with chess, the more of these patterns you see, the quicker you catch them. And that's how you improve, I think, the, the most is by learning these basic tactical themes at, at the beginner levels. Are you, when you're discovering those patterns, are you looking at the chessboard or are you looking at some like, higher dimensional representation of the the relative position of the pieces. You know, so basically something that's disjoint of the particular absolute position of the piece, but like you're seeing patterns like this kind of pattern, but elsewhere on the board. Like yeah, are, are think you thinking in, in patterns or in like absolute positions of the pieces? Both. I think that uh, at the higher levels, you're you're always thinking about like, you're, you're thinking about the patterns on one side of the board specifically, but then also, what happens is you play more and more if you're a very strong player, you will be able to remember, say, pawn structures where the pawns are on certain squares from games that you've played like 15, 20 years ago, even potentially. Um, so it's a mix. I think a lot of it is more subconscious than actively thinking about it and like figuring it out like that. Um, the only thing for me that I definitely am doing very frequently when I, when I play is, is trying to look at my pieces, are they placed on the optimal squares? Are there better squares? And then once I get past that, like using the basic logic, I start to think about, okay, what pure calculations, like what are the moves that make a lot of sense and start calculating direct moves. But one of the most basic things that I think that I do that a lot of people actually should do that they don't do is looking at the piece placement and trying to figure out what pieces look like they're on good squares versus bad squares. <laughs> so am I, for each piece asking the question, am I in my happy place? Am I in my like optimally yeah, happy place? Yeah, I think that's very important. Like if we look at this position on the board right now, this is a good example. Who is not in their happy place on the board right now? I think both both sides are actually pretty happy right now. But the thing is, if you're playing with a black piece, there's what is what is a move that sticks out to you to like follow basic principles? Basic principles probably bring out the bishop. And then castle the king. And castle the king. Right. Exactly. That's that's correct. And and that's what you should do. That's mm -hmm. the best way to play the position. Mm -hmm. Um, now, once you do that, though, I, by the way, I have a vibrating device inside <laughs> you right now, so I knew that. Right, and so my rating is thirty four hundred, which is what I believe Stockfish is. Mm -hmm. No, anyway. it's higher. It's like thirty eight hundred, actually. Is it thirty eight? I think it is. I'm using an earlier version of Stockfish. Okay. 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 Anyway, sorry, you were saying. So, like that's that's very basic. But then, if you move the bishop out and you castle the king, well, let's just say bishop e seven, play this, you castle. Okay, so now you've you've done everything with the pieces on the king side. Mm -hmm. So what would be the next set of what what's the next way to try and develop the pieces? So it, everything here is pretty strong, except maybe this pawn. I don't okay, know. Okay, but think about the pieces. So by pieces, I mean everything Piece. except the pawns. Okay, except the pawns. Okay, uh, probably either either bishop or knight right. uh, on the other side. Yeah, that and that is correct. You want to bring out the bishop and the knight. So let's say you go bishop, bishop to e6. e6. Yeah. Yeah. I'll castle. Now you can move the knight to either square. It's somewhat irrelevant, but just move the knight. I'll just play it. Knight move. to c6. Well, what what was your random move? Bringing I, the bishop I just moved my rook to the center. Okay. Got it. Oh, well, well, yeah. What's your unhappy place? Okay. Right so now? let me move the queen to just follow some basic principles. Okay. Because I want to bring my rooks to the center of the board. Yes. So, like in this position, you've pretty much developed all your pieces. There are only two pieces that you haven't brought into the game. The the queen, queen and the and, rook and yeah. the rook, and this you consider to be in the game because it was... um I wouldn't say it's it's in the game, but there isn't really a great square for that rook right now. Okay. Um, but 
in this position, you would probably move your rook to c8. And then the middle game begins after that. Got it. So here. Yes. Because now you've gotten your piece to all the optimal squares, and now you have to look for a specific plan, but you have gotten these pieces developed um, out of the opening. Yeah. And that's that's like a very basic thing that I think a lot of people don't think about is like, what are the optimal placements for the pieces? So you're so, constantly thinking about the pieces that are not in their optimal placement as you're mm -hmm. doing all the other kind of tactics right. and stuff yes. like that. But that's a basic thing that people can follow. Actually doing pure calculations, like look moving five or 10 moves in your head, that's not realistic. But trying to use basic logic to figure out what pieces look, what pieces are on squares that look correct is something anybody can do. What about looking at the other person's pieces and thinking about the optimal placement of them. Like if you see a bunch of pieces not in their optimal placement for the opponent, what does that tell you? I mean, that's a higher level concept, of course. That Like I'm trying to give a beginner yes. example. Um, that is something that I do think about as well. Like I try to think about my opponent's pieces. Like that, that is basic logic. I think a lot of people these days at the upper levels of chess, they look at the game as something of pure calculation. And you lose that human element. You're trying to just calculate all these different sequences of moves, and you don't think about the, the basics. Um, and it's something, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the next generation of kids who become very strong, because that is really how they approach the game. They learn with computers. Whereas like, I learned with computers at a certain point, but it's, I did not start off with computers from the get-go. So that human element still exists in my game. Actually, Magnus, I think, has said this too, where he did not use a computer, I think, until he was maybe like, 11 years old, something something around there. And so we have that human element to our game that I think the newer generation won't have. Now, it doesn't mean they aren't gonna be better than us, but it's gonna be a completely different approach. What do you mean by human elements? Just basic logic versus raw calculation? So it's like anybody now will use a computer from the time they start the game. And, the, and you use a computer, you look at the evaluations after the game to see how you're doing. But you, it, you don't really ever have those moments where you're just, it's you. Yeah. Or it's just you and your opponent. One thing that was great in the old days before computers simply became too strong is that you would actually do analysis with your opponent after the game. And that's very much this two humans analyzing the game. It's you and your, your opponent, two peers, and you come up with these human ideas. It's not automatically run back to your room, look with a computer, and, oh, I should have played this move, and it's just like winning the game. So that is kind of something that has that no longer exists um, in the game of chess because, as I said, there's no reason to analyze with your opponent after the game. Are there ideas that the engine tells you that you can't reverse engineer with logic why that makes sense and you start to just memorize it, that's good? Um, yes, so in the opening, for sure, there are certain positions where moves are playable. And I, I can even give you an example, actually, in this night or if we can just set the position up a few moves earlier. Yeah, knight over on b8, bishop on c8. And just move the king back to the center. Bishop back to f8. And pawn to e7. So the pawn in front of the king just push it back two squares. So, like, here's an example. There's a move here that nowadays humans will play, which is this move pawn to h4. Um, and this this is a move that 20 years ago, if someone showed this move to Kasparov, he would just laugh at them. No matter who you were, he would basically say, you're an idiot. What What is this move? Like, you're pushing a pawn on the edge of the board. It does nothing. Yeah. And this is something that's it's playable. But even if you were to ask me or any other top grandmaster why it's playable or why it's, why it's a move that makes sense, we wouldn't be able to say why it makes sense. Because mm -hmm. it, it doesn't. We just know that it's fine because the computer says it's fine. It's fine or is it good? It's, um, it's just fine. It can, it, it probably like everything else is equal with perfect play, but it definitely, if you're not careful with black, you can be worse for sure. But if you ask me, I can't say why it's a good move. I can say, okay, maybe I'm going to expand on the king side. I'll push this pawn here and push the pawn forward. Uh, maybe, maybe I can put the bishop on g5 and in some position, the pawn guards the bishop. But I can't give like an actual good explanation for why it's a move that makes sense because it doesn't make sense. It's fascinating that young people today kids these days would probably do that move much more uh, nonchalantly. You'll see that a lot more because they know it's safe at least. Right, because I know the computer says it's fine, but yeah. I grew up without computers. And so to me, it's you're pushing a pawn on the edge. It's the opening phase. You don't do things like this. It's just, it, it looks ridiculous. Now, of course, I have worked with computers long enough that I know, like I'm not, I, I, I know the computers are, um, computers prove that that everything is fine. But still, to me, it does feel wrong. Yeah. Well, I think as computers get better, they'll also get better at explaining, which they currently don't do. 
at, at basically being able to do of, so first of all, simple language generation. So a set of chess moves to language conversion, explaining to us dumb humans of why this is an interesting tactical idea. They currently don't do that. You're supposed to figure that out yourself. Like why, what's the deep wisdom in this particular pawn coming out in this kind of way?